Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're in a series right now called Complete Joy, and I'm really excited about this installment of this series. We're eight weeks in to the series, and I don't know if I've been more excited about a topic as I am today. People need community. We are, our human nature is to long for community. Some of us need more social interaction than others, but we were all created for community. When God created Adam, the first time that God ever said that something was not good was when he noticed that Adam was alone and there was no one like him that what? That he could do life with. No one like him that Adam could live in community with. It's actually a form of torture to isolate someone with absolutely no human contact for a long period of time. We were designed to do life with other people. Right now, we are all at varying degrees of isolation, but at the very least, we are having less human contact than what we are used to. I know that there are even some introverts who are ready to go out and play. I've talked to several in the last week who say, usually I get recharged by going home and I just, I'm, I'm good if it's just me and my family, but I'm ready to get out and I'm ready to see some people again and I'm ready to have some people over to the house and we are people who need, who long for community in times of social disconnection and and physical disconnecting from our church family can weigh on us mentally and spiritually and emotionally. And I really think that today's text is going to be a really great reminder for us to make sure that we're keeping our joy even in less than ideal circumstances. And no matter how you feel about what's going on right now, I think we can all agree that we are living right now in less than ideal circumstances circumstances. So how do we keep our joy, and not just a little bit of joy, but how do we keep full and complete God-given joy in less than ideal circumstances? How do we find hope in a situation that sometimes seems hopeless? How do we keep faith when our faith has led us to the point that we are now? How can I keep my joy when there's nothing around me to be happy about the answer is actually really simple we remember who we are in Christ Jesus that last part is so important I don't want you just to remember who you are I want you to remember who you are in Christ Jesus it's an issue for us when we find spiritual confidence in ourselves it's also an issue for us when we don't have any confidence spiritually. So how do we justify those two things? We understand that the source of our confidence is Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's what our text really lays out for us today. The title of my message this morning is Confidence in Christ. Christ, confidence in Christ. And so during this study on complete joy, we're doing a verse by verse breakdown of the book of Philippians. And this week brings us into the third chapter of Philippians. Now, there are four chapters in Philippians, and we are beginning the third chapter. So we're right at the halfway mark. And Paul says this this morning, we're going to be in Philippians 3 1 through 6. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. We're going to come back to that in a minute because nobody wants to fall in that category, right? Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day 
of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. And that's where we're going to stop talk today as we talk about having our confidence in Christ. So let's go back up to verse number one, and we're going to break it down. Paul says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Further, the word further here would actually probably more accurately be translated as finally. Paul is beginning to wrap up his letter. Now we understand that we're only halfway through the letter. So Paul is being uh, kind of like a, a preacher does whenever he's about halfway through and he's trying to get everybody's attention back and he says, okay, I'm finishing now, okay? Just, just give me five more minutes. Well, that's what Paul is doing. He's saying, finally, and he's wrapping up, he's beginning to wrap up his letter even though he's only halfway through. He says, finally, and he begins to end the letter by reminding them of the theme of the entire letter, and that is to rejoice in the Lord. Make sure that you are keeping your joy. And he actually says, it's not inconvenient for me to repeat myself. In fact, by repeating myself, by telling you continually to rejoice in the Lord, that is actually a safeguard that I'm putting in place for you. You need to be reminded often when you're in the middle of a struggle that you can still have joy and that it comes from the Lord. When you're in the middle of of the fire, when, when you're in the chains, when you're having marriage problems, when you're, you've got job loss and, and layoffs, when your child is in rebellion, when you're in the middle of your mess, your emotions will try to dominate your thought pattern. And what Paul is saying is, that's okay. It's okay if you forgot that I told you to have joy all the way back in chapter number one. And it's okay if you forgot that I told you to rejoice in the Lord and keep your joy in chapter number two because it's chapter number three and I'm back to remind you again. It's not a problem for me to remind you to rejoice in the Lord. I know that you're facing down a mountain that you don't know if you'll be able to climb it or not and fear is going to be screaming at you during those seasons. Maybe that fear is louder than this letter that's being read to the church and in case it is, in case you've zoned out, don't we do that? We, we, we zone out. When something is in my mind, I'm having, a, I'm having a struggle, I'm going through a trial, then that's the thing. That I'll play over and over and over and over and over in my mind. And what Paul is saying is, since, since someone began reading this letter to you, church, I believe that while they've been reading what are the first two chapters of Philippians, it's possible that some of you have zoned out and began again to focus on your problems. So it's no problem for me to tell you again today to rejoice in the Lord. It's safe for you that I should repeat this. Not just to have joy, but to base that joy on the Lord who does not change like shifting shadows. Paul says, I know that I'm repeating myself. I'm doing it for your safety. I'm doing it for your good, for your spiritual and mental protection. I'm repeating myself because you'll have to remind yourself often in the middle of a mess that you can still have joy because your joy stands on a foundation of the once and for all finished work of Jesus Christ. Remember what we talked about back in Philippians 2. It was all finished on the cross. All of this joy that we have is because of Jesus. There are no takebacks. There are no do-overs. When Jesus said, it is finished, then that finished the rule of sin in your life. When Jesus said, it is finished, that finished the bondage of anxiety in your life. 
It finished the control of fear in your life. It finished even the sting of death in your life. So it's no problem for me, Paul says, to remind you again to rejoice in the Lord. I may be in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death right now, but I'm just going to keep reminding myself that even when I'm in the valley, the Lord is still with me, and I'm going to keep the joy that He gave me. I'm going to keep the peace that He bought for me. I'm going to keep my faith because my confidence is not in me, and my confidence is not in what surrounds me. My confidence is in who is living inside of me. I want to say it again, because if you don't get that, you're going to miss everything today. Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord, and he's saying it from prison. While the church at Philippi is going through mess, he's reminding them, rejoice in the Lord. How can you say that? The only way that you can say that is when your confidence, the confidence in your joy is not based on yourself, because we mess up. It's not based on what's around us because what's around us can and will and is ever changing. But our confidence is based on the foundation of who is inside of us. Jesus Christ who never shifts, who never changes, who is always solid no matter what we're doing or what we're going through. So I need to remind someone today to rejoice in the Lord. Right where you are right in the middle of it. It isn't inconvenient for me to continue to say it. It's not a wasted breath to remind you today what we've been talking about for weeks. It's no trouble for me to come back and say again and again and again, no matter what you're going through today, you can still have joy founded in Christ. Because my confidence is not in me. So Paul says, further, Rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. In verse number two. So far, this is one of my favorite verses in, in all of Philippians, and you really wouldn't think that it would be, but I've really actually enjoyed this verse, verses two and three. He says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. It's interesting because Paul is taking distinctions that used to divide Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were of the circumcision, the Gentiles were not. So the Jews thought of themselves to be better than anyone who was not Jewish. And they thought this to the extent that Jews would actually call Gentiles dogs. Paul's a brilliant writer. And so Paul says, watch out for those dogs. Now he's talking to a group of Jewish people, but he's not talking about Gentile people. When he says, watch out for those dogs, he's actually talking about other Jews. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Then he says, it is we who are the circumcision. Well, who is that? Does he mean Jews? Does he mean Gentiles? No, he's actually just flipping the script on them. Part of the Jewish law was circumcision... Eight days after a child was born, after a male was born. Paul is saying that those who practice circumcision as a way to earn right standing with God are mutilators of the flesh. He's saying all you're doing is cutting yourself physically and it's producing no good if that is how you're trying to earn your right standing by going through the law. It's an interesting word choice, mutilators of the flesh, because being a mutilator of the flesh is actually a sin against the law itself. It was against the law to be a mutilator of the flesh. That's his way of saying 
that when we seek righteousness on our own through the law, we are actually breaking the law. He's saying that it's evil, evildoers, dogs, evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. He's actually saying that it is evil for you to put confidence in yourself and in your ability to earn your way into relationship with God. And that's what they were trying to do. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. You can't do that. That's wrong. That's evil. We are the circumcision. Under the new covenant, Paul says, we are the circumcision who <clears throat> serve God by his spirit. What does that mean? That we are the circumcision. Because if you're just reading over this, it would be easy to think that Paul is still talking about Gentiles as dogs. And they can't earn their way in. And Jews as the we, we are the circumcision. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that our circumcision no longer comes through a physical cutting away. But now our cutting away happens by the Holy Spirit. And the, we are the circumcision. Who is the we? That's us. Everyone who's born again. Everyone who has found themselves in Christ. Now we are the circumcision. Colossians 2, 10 through 11. It says, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. That means that it wasn't physical. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. What got cut away? In the text, what got cut away? Not just a small physical part of me. Colossians 2.11 actually says that my whole self got cut away by the Holy Spirit when I became new in Christ. All of Ryan was cut away when the Holy Spirit did his work. And now the spirit man that is on the inside of me has been made completely new. That is my confidence. That is my joy. Not in that I could do something or be good enough or say the right thing or serve enough or give enough. All of that stuff is no good, Paul says. All of my confidence comes through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. It's also really interesting to me that when Jesus came, he, he fulfilled the law. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. The law was perfect, but man was imperfect, and an imperfect man got into the law and ruined it. And so Jesus comes to fulfill the law. So every time we see Jesus talking about the law, he's taking it to the next level. Right? You've heard it said, don't murder. I'm telling you, don't even be mad at someone. If you're even mad at someone, if you have bitterness towards someone in your heart, it's just like you murdered them. Every time we see Jesus talking about the law, he's taking it to the next level. Paul's doing the same thing right here. Paul says, we used to cut away a small physical part of ourselves that showed that we were a part of the family of God. And now we've elevated that. And what are we cutting away now? All of us. Every bit of me had to go so that I could be made new in Christ. My confidence is in Jesus. God is the one who does the work in us. So that no one could boast about how good they are according to the law. My boast is in Jesus Christ. I can promise you that the only thing that is good inside of me is Jesus. The only thing that's good in me is Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. The cutting away that was required of me was done by the Holy Spirit. And I have no confidence that I could do this in my flesh. Paul puts everyone in two groups here. Those who have confidence in their own flesh and those who belong in Christ Jesus and who have no confidence in their flesh at all. There's no middle ground. I want you to see that this morning. There's no place where you can take a little bit of grace and a little bit of me being good and put those things together and work my way into the family of God. It never works like that anywhere in Scripture. 
Paul's saying you either have confidence in God and what he can do and who he is, or you have confidence in yourself. One of them is good. The other one, Paul says, you're a dog and an evildoer. So who today will we put our confidence in? Paul says in Romans chapter number 2 that if we choose to live by the law and we try to work our way into the family of God on our own ability, then we will be judged by the law. Paul says if you choose to live by the law, then you will be judged by the law. And I promise you that none of us want to be judged by the law. I don't want to be judged by the law. I want to be judged by the grace of God in my life. I want Jesus to be sitting on the seat of mercy when he judges me. I don't want to be judged for my goodness. Because I know that I will never be good enough. I have no confidence in my flesh. You know why I don't have any confidence in my flesh? Because I know my flesh better than anybody else. Paul actually says in one of his letters that he's, he's the chief among sinners. And we think, well, how can that be? This is, we're talking about Paul. How can he be chief among sinners? Well, to Paul, he was. Paul knew more sins that he had committed than he knew that anybody else had committed because he knew himself. To me, do you know who chief among sinners is? To me, it's me. I have no confidence in myself because I know myself. I know my flesh. I know that my flesh will fall and fail every single time. And Paul understood that. And in verses 4 through 6, he really digs into some things. And he gives us a list of things that he's not confident in. These are reasons to not be confident in your place in Christ. And that's where we're going to be for the rest of our time today. Verse number four. <clears throat> Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. He's saying, if anybody should be confident in their own ability, if anybody should be confident in their flesh, it is me. And then he goes on to list his resume, but you have to see this for what Paul is actually doing, or you'll think that he's just coming on to the Philippians and bragging about himself, like, this is how great I am. But actually what Paul is saying is, I have no confidence in these things. The world may look on me with certain regard because of this list of things, but I have absolutely no confidence in any of the things that I'm about to tell you. This is my resume, and none of it matters compared to the work of Jesus in my life. Verse number five, he lists them out. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So we're going to take each of these things and we're going to break them down and we're going to put them in our terms today. If Paul was writing this letter to the church today, how would it sound? He says, circumcised on the eighth day. Here's how that sounds in the church today. I've been in this thing since I was born. I'm not some Johnny-come-lately recent convert. I cut my teeth on the back of a church pew. I was there on, here's one, I was there on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and for prayer meeting night, and if we had revival, I was there every single night. That's what Paul is saying. I've been in this thing my whole life. If the doors of the church were open, we were there. I was dedicated when I was a baby. I got saved whenever I was eight. I got baptized when I was 12. That's what Paul is saying. I've been in this thing forever. Circumcised on the eighth day, just like a good Jewish boy should be. I've been in this thing forever. Nobody's going to be able to say that they've been doing this for longer than me unless they're older than me. 
Doesn't that sound familiar? It sounds familiar to me. I've been doing this all my life. I haven't been doing nothing but going to church. I've been at church more than I've been at any other place. But my confidence, this is what Paul is saying, but my, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I've been in this thing forever. But my confidence is not in my past. Then he says, of the people of Israel. What he means is I got the right lineage. And I'm of God's people, so I've got all the right connections. Lineage was really important to the Jews because it's where they found their confidence. It's who they were. Their identity was wrapped up in being a Jew. He's saying that he's connected, deeply connected to God's chosen people. But his confidence was not in the people that he knew. And there are people like that. Name droppers, right? When they get in trouble, when they start feeling convicted, when they start feeling hard-pressed, then all of a sudden they say, yeah, but I, 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 I sat under this person's ministry. I listen to this person on TV every single week. Right? I got all the right connections, so you don't know what you're talking about right now. And what Paul is saying is, I've got all the connections. Nobody has more connections than me. But my confidence is not in who I know. Of the tribe of Benjamin, this one seems like it would be similar to of the people of Israel, and it is in some way, but it's actually another step above just being of the people of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin. He's saying, not only am I from the people of Israel, but I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. This is one of the two tribes that made up the Jewish people that survived after the exile to Babylon. They came back. It was Benjamin and Judah. Those two tribes came together to make up the Jewish people as we still know them today. They also just, they just so happened to be the two tribes that came from Jacob's favored wife, Rachel. Leah had ten. They were all lost. Rachel, the favorite, had two. Judah and Benjamin. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, not only do I come from the womb of Jacob, but I come from the favored wife, the youngest born, Benjamin. Nobody has deeper connections to the people of God than I do. But my confidence is not in my heritage. Then he goes on and he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. To us, that just sounds really poetic. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Well, what in the world does that mean? That would be like me saying, an American of Americans, right? A Hebrew of Hebrews. What this literally means is that both of his parents were as pure blood Hebrew as they could be. I'm a Hebrew of two Hebrews. That's what he's saying. Both of his parents were Hebrews. What does that sound like to us today? My mom and them and my daddy and them has always been in the church. And their mama and them and their daddy and them was always in the church. And my great mama and them and my great granddaddy and them, they, what he's saying was, we've always been a part of this. A Hebrew of Hebrews. But my confidence is not in my parents. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. Paul was incredibly, incredibly smart and well-educated man in the law. Paul is saying, in our terms, I can quote more scripture than all of you can. I know more law than anybody who this letter is being read to. And I've got the Bible school degree to prove it, right? It's on the wall in my office. This is what Paul's saying. Don't come at me with questions about the law, trying to trip me up about the law, because I know more about the law than any of you, but my confidence is not in my biblical knowledge. As for zeal persecuting the church, <clears throat> what's he saying there? Don't you remember when I was playing for the other team? How good I was for the other team? Nobody tracked down more people of the way than I did. 
Nobody tracked down more Christians than me. Nobody did it with more passion than me. But my confidence is not in my passion. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. To be a Pharisee meant to be someone who kept the law in the strictest form. What he's saying here in our terms, none of you had followed more rules in the Bible than I have. I've always kept the Sabbath. I've always honored my father and mother. I've always paid my tithe. I've always served in the church. I've always faithfully gone to the house of God. And I've given to missions. And I've loved my neighbor. And I've served others. You can go on down the list. And no one will be able to do more than me. Because when it comes to the law, I am the strictest on the law. I am a Pharisee. When it comes to the law, you will find no one who's more righteous than I am. But my confidence is not in my ability to follow the rules. As a lifelong follower of Jesus, I can tell you that it's a dangerous trap to fall into. When you start getting convicted about something in your life and you know because you're reading the Bible and you're studying that something just doesn't line up with the Word of God, and all of a sudden you start to lean on that church pedigree a little bit. You start remembering all the good you've done. You start remembering all the services you've been to. And Paul is saying that if your confidence is based on those things, then ultimately you will fail. That if your confidence is based on who your parents were, what connections you have, how good you can be according to the Bible, how many scriptures of Bible that you know, when your confidence is based on those things instead of in Christ, then there's no way that you can live a life of complete and full joy. Paul says there's no one who's more qualified to have confidence in the flesh than me. But his confidence is still not in who he was or what he could do. And it has to be the same with us today. Our confidence has to be in who we are in Christ Jesus. King David in the Old Testament, he had plenty of reasons to be confident. King of God's people anointed to be king whenever he was just a child slayed a giant you ever heard that story that's a good one you grow up and when you were a little boy you killed the philistine giant with a stone and when you walk into the room people still talk about it 20 years later 30 years later 40 years later said to be a man after the very heart of God. He had some reasons to be confident. But he writes in Psalm, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, here it is. Even then I will be confident. Where does David get his confidence? The same place that we get our confidence. He tells us at the beginning of the psalm, The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. So I can be confident in Christ maybe you feel like David in this psalm today maybe you feel like the enemy is advancing that people are cheering for you to stumble and to fall and I just want to bring a word of encouragement to you today you don't have to live in fear you don't have to live in live in anxiety I said it last week and the week before, and the week before, and the week before, but it's no problem for me to remind you again. Rejoice in the Lord. Keep your joy in who you are, in the place that you have in the family of God. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I'll say rejoice. Rejoice in who you are in Jesus and in what he has done for you. I want you to have spiritual confidence. 
We're not called to walk around spiritually scared. Like if we make one misstep that we're out of the family. That's not the nature of our loving, merciful God. I want you to walk in spiritual confidence in who you are as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. I just don't want you to place your confidence in yourself. And I don't want you to place your confidence in me. I don't want you to place your confidence in your knowledge or your ability to be good or your ability to come to a church service. Because when all of that stuff can go away and we never thought that some of those things will be taken away. And we're living in the middle right now of one of those things being taken away. And we never thought it would be gone. But when everything else is stripped away. When you stumble, when you fail, when circumstances all around you change, you can still be confident in who you are in Christ. You can still have complete joy when that joy is founded on who you are in Jesus alone. My confidence is in Christ. I want you to walk in confidence and I want you to walk in complete joy because the work is finished. The price is was paid let's pray anxiety you have no place in the name of Jesus fear you have no place depression you have no place in the name of Jesus we are going to from this day forward walk in complete confidence in who we are in Jesus the Lord is the stronghold of our life The Lord is my light, and He is my salvation. Him and Him alone. Jesus plus nothing gives me everything that I will ever need, and I am confident in who I am in Christ. In the name of Jesus, my God, Right now, there is somebody who is watching this who is experiencing fear on a level that you have never known. Anxiety. Every time you lay your head down at night, those anxious thoughts come back in. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High God. And fear has no place in your life. We're going to walk in confidence, not in ourselves, not confidence in government, not confidence in economy, not confidence in anything else except for that we are in Christ. That I was crucified with Christ. That I was buried with Christ. But I have been raised to new life in Christ as well. And my confidence is completely and fully placed in Him. If you're watching live stream this morning, you don't have relationship with Jesus. You don't know the confidence that comes from walking with Jesus. I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like knowing that everything doesn't depend on you. That everything doesn't depend on the shifting circumstances around you. If you're watching our live stream this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but you want to have a relationship with Him, then today is your day. I want you to bow your head with me now, if you will. If that's you and you want new relationship with Jesus, I just want you to say this prayer with me. God, I thank you for grace. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I've made mistakes in my past, but I believe in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. I believe that that work takes care of all of my sin. I believe that the work of Jesus paid the price that I could not pay for my sin. So from this day forward, I commit my life to following you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, maybe you've never began following Jesus, or maybe you followed Him, but you're far from Him. I want you to reach out to us today. We want you to know that you don't have to do spiritual journey alone. You don't have to go through life alone. 
reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. Somebody is at every social media platform right now. If you reach out, they'll reach back out to you. We want to start walking this discipleship journey with you. Maybe you're watching this morning and you're living in fear with anxiety or with depression. Or maybe you've tried to put some confidence in who you are and how good you can be. You accepted grace and salvation, but now you feel like you have to work really hard to maintain your spot in the family. That's not your place. I want to challenge you today to put your confidence where it belongs. And that's completely and 100% in Christ Jesus. Put your confidence in Him. That is the way to live a life of complete and full joy. No matter come what may, bring it on. I'm going to keep my joy. Because nothing else gave me this joy. The government certainly didn't give me my joy. My bank account didn't give me my joy. My church didn't give me my joy. My Bible knowledge didn't give me my joy. My parents didn't give me my joy. One thing, and one thing alone, Jesus Christ, above everything else, Jesus gave me my joy. And nothing else can take away something that Jesus alone has the power to give me. So I want you to walk in joy, complete and full joy in who you are in Jesus. I want to invite you just like we've done every week here in just a moment. I'm going to pray over you. And then I want to invite you to have a time of prayer there in your home. If you're by yourself, take some time with you and God. If you're there with your family, then gather your family around. And I want you to pray over what we talked about today. If you have kids, this is a fantastic time to talk to them about who they are in Christ and where their confidence spiritually belongs. Let's be vulnerable today. Spend some time in prayer with our families. Before we do that, though, I want to pray over you as we dismiss. Lord, God, I thank you again for every person who decided to join in online worship with us today. God, I pray that you've redeemed this time. That we leave this time together as closer disciples. As people who are longing for you and striving for you more and more. But we're doing it the right way. All the while with our confidence, not in ourselves or our circumstances, but in Christ alone. Thank you, God, for giving your only son. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your kindness that draws me to repentance that does a work in my life, a cutting away in my life that I could never do on my own. We praise you, Lord, in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I love you, church, so much. Make sure that you're checking out our daily devos. We're sending those out in text message and we're sending them out on our Facebook every day. Uh, like, comment, share on those and we'll see you back Wednesday night for Bible study. Love you a lot. Have a great day.